I would like to say a few words about how I became a computational neuroscientist. So it all started when it was time for me to decide what I want to study in the university. And at the time, my major um, 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 experience that shaped my mind was an immigration experience. As, it's, um, as a little child of 13 years old, I moved from Ukraine which was part of this communist bloc to Germany, which was part of the West. And that experience uh, told me that it's very important to have, a, to have an education and a career that is transferable between countries. So we need to, I, I thought I would need to understand something about the, um, the, the world and the, um, the, the methods that are used in the world that are transferable. And there is, um, there are very little, um, there are very low number of professions that can do that. If you are a doctor, you can't change countries. If you are a teacher, you can't do that either. And, and I was looking for professions that could do that. And um, I had an aptitude, I think, for mathematics and physics. And I thought that's one of the few professions that would enable us to move between countries. And regardless of what happens in politics, you can always find a job. That was my mo main motivation to go into physics. And then and, and later on, I discovered I wanted not only to understand the tools, but I wanted to apply it to something where the loop between experiments and theory is short. So when you, when you are a um, nuclear physicist, um, the moment you discover some effect, it will take years or decades for some experimentalists to test that. And that was too long for me. Um, I didn't have that patience. So um, I, just, um, I, I, I thought that I would like to have um, a, a topic to work on that has this uh, shorter time constant, but also is something that is directly related to, to our everyday life. And biology was, and particularly the brain, was something that I thought is worth to understand. And there are many open problems to be addressed yet, despite the fact that neuroscience is about 100 or 200 years old. So that's kind of the motivation why I drifted from physics or why I came to physics and then um, how I came to computational neuroscience. Now, in my talk, um, kind of building on the notion of universal um, methods that you need in order to understand different problems, the goal of my talk is to teach you one concept only, and that is uh, the concept of linear response dynamics. And um, to show you how it can be applied to different phenomena that are naturally, when you look at linear con response concepts, you wouldn't normally associate them with this concept. So the, the overall theme, uh, theme that we try to understand is um, we want to make sure we, we can interpret the spiking of a network, which means that when we look at the individual spike times of neuron 1 and neuron n, we would like to see in that pattern somehow reflected what that network was experiencing, the sort of stimuli that were driving the neurons and from the activity of the network, we could say if this is a network that's moving an arm or processing a visual stream, whatever the computations that are implemented here, we want to decode the fundamental features that makes it possible to implement these computations. So when we think about a computer, we know that regardless of the software we are trying to write, whether it's in MATLAB, in Python or other languages, it all boils down to X, um, XORs and, and, and other logical gates. You can write any um, addition, multiplication or other complicated functions using a very small number of universal computing units. And that's sort of the scheme that we are looking for a minimal description of how to understand even more complex computations by finding the methods to boil the complex computations down into a simpler mathematically tractable form. And the concept of linear response functions has been useful in, in a number of areas. And one of them is the ray dynamics, where we present a stimulus. This is S of t. This, uh, t denotes the time and S denotes the amplitude of the stimulus at the time uh, t. And, and then we are looking at the activity and population activity means fine rate activity of the whole population average across neurons as a function of time. And the, the notion of the linear response function was useful to understand how this R of t is described by S of t. So kind of understand the mapping between the input and the output of the network. But it is also useful when we think about pairs of neurons. So if you consider a pair of neurons, you can wonder about how correlated these neurons are. Are they uncorrelated, meaning that they each have their own life? 
or whether there is something about them that makes them synchronous, for example. So the linear response concept can also help you understand synchrony in neural networks. But it can, also, um, it can help you also understand global oscillations, which means that um, not only the notion of sort of stochastic synchrony, occasionally these neurons um, spike together, but the sort of global oscillations um, where there's periodicity in the activity of the neurons. Even so, linear response in its name has the word linear, which means that it's kind of would normally be applied to linear small perturbations, it can help you understand phenomena that range beyond the linear realm. And that's sort of the theme of my talk that I would like to, to convey to you that even so linear may mean it's limited in its um, usability to small perturbations. It, it is applied to phenomena that transcend that, um, that, that um, are for example global oscillations. But you can also use linear responses linear response functions to understand how information is transmitted, so how many bits are transferred from the input to the output. That's something that we can discuss later because I want to, to make the talk a little bit more contained. Um, so the goal for these lectures are as follows. So that's kind of the structure of the lecture that um, I will follow. Um, first, I will start with the linear response function definition to make sure you understand the mathematics of what makes a linear response function work. Um, then we will go on to look at how these functions can be measured in any given experiment. And then we will explore the topic of pairwise spike correlations and how linear responses are related to that. Then we will move on to phase transitions and specifically the phase transitions between asynchronous irregular state that Juliana alluded to in her talk and then look for, um, for features in that network activity that will translate irregularly active networks into uh, synchronously active networks and networks that exhibit oscillations, for example. And then um, in the last part, I would like to shed light on linear and nonlinear models and see and, and teach you how the linear response functions affects also that transformation. So we will think about um, feed forward, um, feed forward chains and uh, see how and when you need a nonlinearity and when you potentially can do without. And in the tutorial, there is the option of discussing information coding. And what I would like to do uh, more interactively with you is um, calculate or go through a specific calculation of a linear response function in a model. And I will um, use a model that I have, I have been working on for a long time and that's very tractable. I think you don't need a lot of mathematical prior knowledge to make the calculations. All you need is basic um, integration techniques and differentiation techniques, but nothing beyond that. Okay, and throughout my talk, I would um, like to, um, to ask you some, some basic questions. So we will uh, focus on some quizzes and I hope to inspire some critical discussions. So please feel free to interrupt me at in any time and, and, and ask for clarifying questions. And um, also let me mention that this particular topic that I will cover in this talk will um, hopefully soon appear in a review in current biology. So if you want to look at the citations that are related to this uh, concept, you can, you can look it up there. Okay, so linear response function has a long tradition and in, uh, in, in that tradition uh, goes back to 1887. It has uh, been formalized by um, two mathematicians Volterra and Wiener, however, it was done um, mainly for engineering purposes. It was a problem of systems identification when that uh, linear response function definition was first um, formalized. The question was how to predict the output of any nonlinear system if we know the input. So at this point, people haven't thought about neurons specifically or neural networks. They were just wondering if I have a black box and I give an input and I have a specific functional output, if I change the input, what can I say about the output of that black box for a new stimulus? So how can I formalize this black box in terms of equations, regardless of what this black box is? And um, there is also more, um, um, more work obviously from the last century which was um, a delight to read so if you are interested in the background for how this has been um, this uh, linear response definitions have been translated to white noise analysis something that has been also termed reverse correlation this is a wonderful paper to start with okay so what is linear response function <clears throat> 
So we think about um, the stimuli first that we want to feed our, uh, our black box. This is our black box. We don't know anything about how they are connected inside this black box. We don't even know the type of the neurons. We just know that we feed this black box stimuli that are either constant or varying in time. And when they are time varying, they have a specific frequency. So we describe the inputs to that black box as sinusoids of different frequencies. And um, what we're wondering is what happens on the, uh, on the other side. So first, it, it's important to recall that we assume that the black box is initially, before we perturb it, in a steady state. So it, it has some intrinsic dynamics that doesn't change as a function of time. It's, it's stationary, and we don't know exactly what this is. We just assume that it, it reaches steady state, and now we perturb this steady state. And we perturb it with sinusoids of different frequency. The first trivial frequency is a constant, then the next one is omega 1, 2, and so on, up to infinity. So when we feed one frequency only, for example this one, we obtain on the other side uh, this response. So that's on top of the stationary response. What can happen is obviously if we start with an amplitude delta s here, we might not get delta s out because the system may not be directly linear, right? However, if the perturbation is small in its amplitude, regardless of the details of the system, the response would also be small. So there is a threshold below which, if you choose um, a stimulus amplitude below some threshold, the system will respond linearly to that perturbation. Obviously, if you increase the amplitude, it will no longer be linear. But if we assume that the perturbation here is small, the response would also be small. And if the frequency that is present here, um, because it is linear, the response would also be linear. However, there may be a phase shift. So the, there is a phase shift potentially between the response and the input. And also, we are interested in how the amplitude delta s gets translated in this delta r amplitude. So to formalize this, what we are interested in is the following. We have a delta r of omega, depending on the frequency which we picked. And um, this is the stimulus that we obtain on the other side, um, that, that we, so the temporal evolution of the response. I, I said that in general there may be a phase shift, in which case we enter a sinusoid of omega t, but out we get sinusoid of omega t plus phi. One second. And the amplitude is now modified by uh, delta s or that was present originally plus a change of the amplitude that's proportional to the, um, to the uh, function of the black box. Just to clarify, is the input provided to all the neurons in the network yeah. and if so, is it synchronously provided? Yeah. Or? So here we don't know anything about the black box, but for mathematics we assume that it's, it's provided to everybody um, equally, or we are interested in those that we perturb. So the, the unit that we are interested in is perturbed, and then we look for its response. Mathematically, uh, for those who are interested, you can uh, think of a network where you perturb one, one neuron, and then you compute the linear response function for everybody else, including that neuron. <laughs> That's also possible. But here, I thought it's, it's easier to think about the population um, situation where um, delta S refers to the amplitude that's provided in the stimulus for all the neurons, and all the neurons respond with this delta R. Yes? So I get it. You, you have delta S, you have a sign which has the phase shift. Mm -hmm. and is V1 like a scaling factor? Or? Exactly, it's a scaling factor. So depending on the amplitude, uh, depending on the frequency, th this might be a different number. And the reason I put a 1 here is to denote that it's linear, so it's the first order correction. And here was a question. Um, just that basically this uh, linearization somehow. Um, but when, when you said that you do it in one neuron, I guess that then you cannot use integrate and fire. You have to use rates because you, they're not. Oh, we can use integrate and fire, and that's one of the calculations we will do okay. in the tutorial. Okay. So regardless of the system, regardless of whether it's a network, a neuron, or even a membrane, you can assume that there is a steady state and you perturb the steady state. And if you do that with a small enough perturbation, the response of the system will be proportional to the perturbation. Even if the system is composed by, by units that are exactly. not, okay. not linear.
So here the big assumption is that the stimulus is small, and small is obviously a relative term, but it's small enough so that the response follows the stimulus. And in the supplementary slides, uh, you guys um, have the slides of my talk, there are supplementary slides that would give you the higher order corrections that go beyond the linear system, um, which are called Wiener kernels. So there are n order Wiener, Wiener kernels, and the first one would be the linear response. Okay, so this is basically the definition, how uh, linear response functions are defined. And con it is often mathematically more convenient to put this phase shift that occurs into the response function itself. So we would make the response function complex in the sense that the absolute magnitude denotes the amplitude change and the phase of the response function denotes the phase shift of our sinusoids. Yeah? Obviously it's important to think about whether it's a cosine that you put in and then it will be potentially a negative phase shift, but if we agree on uh, the definition of the phase, then we can ap apply or we can uh, formalize the response function definition and it, the, the important thing here is to keep in mind that the response function has always an absolute part, absolute re um, amplitude part and a phase shift. The phase shift denotes the phase shifts between the sinusoids and the absolute part denotes the, the damping or the increase in amplitude, in the absolute amplitude between the input and the output. Okay? So, the linear response is a proportionality factor that describes how changes in the input get translated into changes in the output. Okay? Is this clear to everybody? Okay. Now, um, when we are interested in stimuli that are not just sinusoids, but maybe some other complex function, let's say um, it, it changes from one frequency to the other in some interesting temporal um, structure, then we can compose our stimulus of interest by integrating across the relevant frequency modes. So basically we can um, break down our stimulus of interest into frequency modes. Each one will be passed through its relative, so its own linear response function, because the linear response function depends on the frequency, and then we sum that all up. And that's essentially what this integral means. So the temporal structure of the stimulus is, uh, is written here, and the linear response is the filter with which we convolve our stimulus. And out comes the temporal evolution of the response. So um, if your stimulus of interest is not a sinusoid, then I would ask you to please transfer it to the frequency domain, to the Fourier domain, then break it down into manageable frequency chunks. For each one, we will compute the uh, uh, multiplication here with the with the li linear response function, and then we will sum it all up. Um, this is the, uh, the um, form we obtain the frequency domain, and the time domain it will be a filter. It's a filter between the stimulus and the response. And um, because this concept of linear response functions has a long history, many different names that essentially refer to the same phenomenon have been used, and many of these names um, you, you may have heard already, so I will just recapitulate so you associate the names that you know with the function that I'm describing. So one of the names is Green's function. And Green's function is nothing but the response of a system to a delta perturbation. Now, obviously you can decompose the delta perturbation into its uh, individual frequency modes and then you can sum up to know what would be the response of your system for which you know your linear response function to delta function. So in a sense, the, the use of a Green's function is equivalent mathematically to the use of linear response. In the one case, you use the basis of delta functions, and in the other one, you use uh, Fourier modes. They are both equivalent. Um, historically, Green's function has been used more in the physics community, and linear response uh, has been used more in the engineering community and also neuroscience, but they refer to exactly the same phenomenon. Um, it also is sometimes called impulse response to uh, describe the fact that the system is perturbed and the system is, resp uh, is responding in an impulse to the stimulus. So it's kind of impulse response. If you have a step-like perturbation or if you have a delta perturbation, you're interested in a specific shape of your stimuli and you look for the response of your system to those perturbation shapes. And um, 
there's also another name that's associated with the linear response and that's called susceptibility. And susceptibility in the physics community means, for example, if you take a crystal and you perturb it or you shine light on it, you will find out that the light that comes out of the crystal may be phase shifted or damped. So that susceptibility inside the crystal is, is described as the response divided by the stimulus. And that's precisely the, the linear response concept or the first order uh, concept that we are talking about here. So susceptibility, Green's functions, impulse response functions, linear response functions, they all relate to the same concept. And sometimes people even call that gain for the obvious reason that the response divided by the stimulus, that's the gain of your system. Okay? No questions? Okay, so now the question is how do we actually measure this linear response? Now we, we know what the concept is, what we are interested in, but how can we measure that for any system of our interest? And there are multiple methods, and I will focus on the one that um, refers to the sinusoidal measurements. And I will then allude in the next slides uh, to other types of measurements, um, because for those we need to understand a little bit the um, spike trigger at average, and then we will um, d use spike trigger at average and, and um, the reverse correlation technique to infer the linear response function. That's something that has been described in this paper, in the seminal paper um, that um, has shaped um, the neuroscience community. Okay, so if we are interested in how the system, or the system in this case is, is a neuron, how it reacts to sinusoids of different frequencies, then what we have to do is we need to feed through our patch pipette or our electrode or our light, whatever stimulation paradigm we choose. We need to feed that system different frequencies. And then we will need to record the spikes or the firing rate of these neurons as a function of the stimulus shape that we put in. And the way this is often done is by computing a PSTH. So that's the uh, 0 to 2 pi um, structure of our sinusoid. You, you notice that 0 to 2 pi is independent of the frequencies. You can compute the PSTH for any uh, frequency of interest. And you would record, let's say you, you pick the frequency 5 hertz, then this would be 1 divided by 5 hertz, basically. This would be the duration of your, your period. And you would record the spikes that come at the beginning until the end of your stimulus period. And then you will sort them according to the phase at which they arrived, and potentially you could discover that the response um, of the firing rate is phase shifted to the original sinusoid. And you would record that phase shift, and then you would wonder about, okay, by how much, or how, what, what is the relative change of firing rate relative to the steady state? So you would compute this amplitude over here. I think there was a question. Do this with a, a noise stimulus, or does it have to be like yeah, I will come to the noise stimulus later. But if you are interested in sinusoids for some reason, this is the way to do it. Yeah? Okay, um, the, there are plus and minuses for, for different techniques. The plus here is that you can control exactly the amplitude of the sinusoid. And you can see if the sinusoid that you put in is actually the sinusoid that, this, that, that the neuron gets because there is potentially pre-filtering by the electrode or by the membrane and so on. So that's, I think, a little bit better controlled stimulus. However, you are free to do, um, to choose your stimuli shapes. I just didn't know if, uh, I guess like more basically, I didn't know if you could actually do a for, like the inverse Fourier on noise signals or if you had to kind of know like something more predictable about the sine waves that you're looking at. Um, no, I, I will come to the spike trick at average in a moment and I think that will answer your question. I think uh, visual neurophysiologists are very lucky that the one neurons like sinusoid operations. So I think uh, much of the classical work in visual neurophysiology is based on ratings that is the advantage that it plays directly into this linear response. Exactly. And also let me note that the uh, linear response function here um, has only one dimension, but there are the response functions that have two dimensions. So you could perturb uh, potentially, if you think about a neuron, you can do that as a function of dendritic distance, and you can um, limit the stimulation to one specific uh, spot, or you can do that over extended periods of time. So there are spatial response functions and there are temporal response functions, but nevertheless, there are still response functions. <coughs> 
Okay, now we come to the much anticipated um, <laughs> spike trigger evers that will allow you to choose different uh, shapes of stimuli, not be limited to sinusoids. So the way to think about spike trigger average is the following. If this is the amplitude of your stimulus, uh, this is denoted by the blue line here. And if we know that the spikes are emitted at some times here, here and here, this is the spike of a neuronal population or new neuron of interest, whatever the spikes emerge from, we don't care at this point. All we know is that there is a spike here, here and here, and that's basically it. And as many spikes, um, the, the more spikes you can record, the better will be your estimate. Okay, so what we do is we are interested in the firing rate, uh, we are interested in the stimuli that precedes those spikes. Okay, what does it mean precede a spike? It means that we choose a, a window, tau, and we go back tau relative to each spike. And we record the average stimuli before the spike. So uh, if we decided that this is one millisecond, we go one millisecond back from each spike, and we, we take this number plus this number plus this number, but divide by the number of spikes. That will be the average stimulus one millisecond before a spike. And then we change tau and compute the average stimulus five milliseconds before a spike and so on. We can do that obviously also after the spike. That's not forbidden either. So what we obtain then is a spike triggered stimulus. Stimuli that are preceding or um, following the spikes. So mathematically what it means is that the <coughs> spike triggered definition is, uh, is defined as follows. We look for the stimuli that are preceding minus tau the spikes, and spikes are now uh, part of this R of T. That's something, th this quantity has been defined by Juliana very kindly. This is the response of the neuron. And if you are thinking about spikes, then this will be delta functions in time. But for that matter, for, for our considerations, we don't care about the shape of R of T. We just say we care about the stimuli that precede the spikes. And now tau can be also negative. That will be the, spikes fo uh, the stimuli following the spikes. Okay, so that's the quantity we compute when we think about spike triggered averages. Now, what, what we do next is the following. We remember, we assume that the response of the stimuli, uh, the response of the system is proportional to the stimuli multiplied by the linear response function. That's our assumption that the responses are proportional to the stimuli multiplied by the filter, by our response function. So that's something that we put in, and for convenience, it's best to do that calculation in the Fourier domain because the, um, the convolutions will become multiplications and they're easier to sort. So what we obtain is the Fourier transform of this quantity here is proportional to the linear response function, this omega that comes from here, times the power spectrum of the stimulus. One power spectrum comes from here, from the definition of our R, and the other S comes from the definition of the spike triggered average. And together, what we obtain is that the spike triggered average is proportional in the Fourier domain to the quantity of our interest times the power spectrum. And that precisely answers the question for how to obtain the uh, linear response functions when we don't have stimuli that are sinusoids at our disposal. So we record the spike triggered average and we divide it by the power spectrum. Okay, that will give us precisely that quantity of interest. And the reason is that regardless what the power spectrum is, actually numerically it would be best if it's not too close to zero because you will be dividing by zero. So you will be amplifying um, weakly, um, weak, weak amplitudes. Um, but technically you can divide this by this and obtain this function. And here we made no assumption about what this function is. Um, Precisely the next slide, how could um, spike trigger averages look like? This is computed in, in A model, basically. And what we see is that the, um, relative to the spike, here, this is the time of the spike. Just before the spike, there is a systematic bias for negative, um, for negative um, stimuli. So there is a hyperpolarization first going on. And, but just before the, stimul uh, before the spike, uh, the stimulus rises which means that there is a depolarization going on that will eventually cause the spike. But in some statistical sense, 
uh, for example, in this parameter regime, uh, there could be a hyperpolarization before there is a depolarization. Yeah? So this is kind of interpreting what sort of events might cause the spike. But, but going backwards to what Juliana said, you can also see what, um, what influence the spike had on the statistics of the, of the stimuli. Going backwards, not the spikes, uh, not the stimuli causing the spikes, but the spikes um, kind of shaping the, um, the typical statistics that emerged after them. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, this only takes into consideration when this particular stimuli actually caused the spikes, and you do not look at the, uh, at the uh, occasions where this happened, but no spike was. Uh, yeah, because, yeah. I'm looking specifically for spike triggering statistics, which means I don't care about what happened when there was no spike. Yeah, right. But I mean, this only gives you an indication where the spike might happen, not really an indication that you can trigger a spike. Happen, right? But but if I look at all the events of my interest that are spikes, and I see what was happening before them. Then this is an indication. So I can't. What I can't say is that this is a causal inference. That this stimuli shapes are really causing the spikes. But what I can say is that they are correlated with the occurrence of the spikes. Okay. So the causation versus correlation, I think, is important to differentiate here. They are correlated with the occurrence of a spike. What are the different colors here? Oh, this is. Um, this is something that I've done for a specific model. Here, the, um, the time constant has changed. So some, something about the neuron model has been altered, basically, in which case the end result was that the statistics of the pre-spike events was altered. Now it could be a threshold, it could be time constant of the stimuli, it could be a membrane time constant, refractory period, what have you. But regardless of what this parameter specifically was, there are different shapes associated with that. Okay, so um, and to present you other alternative spike triggered averages and how they might look in cells, here's an example from the weekly electric fish. This is the occurrence of a spike and you see the membrane potential on the surface of the fish um, experiencing a hyperpolarization just before the spike. And um, you can also inter um, look at velocity degrees in a movie uh, in a blowfly H1 neuron, or recorded in a blowfly H1 neuron, and you see that the, when stimulated with this particular, um, at this particular distance, the velocity that seems to be correlated with the occurrence of a spike is a positive velocity. Mm -hmm. Or here, the spike look at average could be computed also in a 2D fashion, so you're presenting movies to your neuron of interest, for example, in the retina, and you're wondering what sort of 2D pixel, a 2D um, image frame is most correlated with the occurrence of spikes. You can do that in two dimensions. Okay? So, um, uh, an, another name to kind of make an association between the different names that are floating around in, in the field, um, this is also called receptive field, for the obvious reason that the cell seems to be receptive for the type of stimuli that are preceding, or that seem to be causing, and important to say, that seem to be causing, or are correlated with the occurrence of a spike. The cell is receptive for these uh, shapes, of spi uh, this uh, stimuli shapes. Okay, so um, we now come to the pyramidal neurons. And the, question for how, uh, and the question how linear response functions look like in pyramidal neurons, because many of us are interested in the cortex. So the question is, how can we measure and how can we interpret the linear response functions of a specific type of neurons that are part of our recurrent network models? And here what we've done is we have measured the linear response um, measure, uh, using a specific correlation factor, but effectively this is proportional to the amplitude of the linear response function. And this is the stimulus frequency. You notice this is a logarithmic axis. What we found is that the, uh, um, the, the linear response function has non-zero amplitudes for frequencies that range up to about 200, 300 hertz. Beyond that, the neurons are no longer susceptible to the stimuli. So if you put in a thousand hertz stimulus, 
the neurons won't see that, basically. They, that would be buried in the noise. But be, if, if you choose a stimulus that, that is less than, let's say, 200, 300 hertz, then there will be a significant modulation of the firing rate of the neuron. And um, other people have obviously done experiments on other types of cells. So they will present you a kind of variety of different shapes of this linear response functions. This is the impedance magnitude in mega ohms. And you see that different cells here have different, um, different shapes. This is the passive property, I think, and this is the active property, if I'm not mistaken. I think there was a question. Sorry, and the signal frequency, is this the frequency of a current injection? Or yeah. Be any it, it's a, here in this particular experiment, it's a current injection. But you can think about other um, stimulation paradigms. If you get a cell model like has like has some type, would you get the same curve? Like, yeah. You, like, uh, can you get them theoretically too? Technically, um, the the linear response shapes depends on the model. So okay, even yeah. in conductance shape, in conductance-based models such as Hodgkin-Huxley, it really depends on which conductances yeah. you put in. And let's say for one conductance you might have this type of curve, and for the other one you might have a little bit of an oscillatory component. So there is no um, right answer. Yes, 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 uh, yes, they, yes. They, they, for every model, there will be a response function. But if you change something, a little, something about this model, let's say you change the input statistics type or thresholds or, or some other parameter, the linear response function will change. Mm -hmm. And yes, you can compute that also for conductance space models. Is that a question? No? No? OK. Um, and here are a few model results. And the features that are apparent in these model results are something that I think um, is, is worth thinking about, or the, the sort of questions, or the sort of um, understanding that these linear response functions enable us to make. That's something we can ponder uh, for a few seconds. So um, the paper by Foucault and Trocmay reported in 2003 the following observation. So um, they've done numerical experiments on conductance-based models with different firing rates. And you notice that this is um, a circle refers to 23 hertz. The, uh, this uh, star-like shape refers to the 66 hertz. But when they normalize this frequency axis relative to the firing rate, so they, they took the input frequency and they divided it by the firing rate of the neuron. Right? We, we, are freely, we are free in scaling our x-axis any way we like. And then they, they discover that when, when they do that in this particular model, it falls, uh, the, the curves follow sort of a universal shape. So um, the inverse seems to be also true, that the more neurons spike, the higher frequencies they can encode. Right? Mm -hmm. So if, if this particular point is now at 100 hertz instead of at 10 hertz, then the neuron uh, will, will be able to process these frequencies up to the firing rate, basically, of the neuron. Mm -hmm. um, so we know that parallel neurons <coughs> in particular get input from like fast spiking neurons, mm -hmm. right? And those are vastly different in their frequencies. Mm -hmm. So I thought, I'm, maybe I'm missing the point of this. Was this saying that you can encode best what kind of um, frequency that you... You intrinsically spike. Right, right. So the intuition can be very different, right? Because they can also, and they, they clearly can get input that's very high, but mm -hmm. do they output or encode um, at a very low level, right? Yeah. Um, yes. So um, to, to understand this phenomenon, I think it's, it's best to consider the following. I give you five spikes. The first one is here. The last one is there. And now I say that the, uh, the fine rate of, of these spikes is, let's say, one hertz. But of this um, neuron is one hertz. But the experiment that I did to record one hertz uh, was such that the neurons were stimulated with 100 hertz. So it means that there are um, many cycles before the next spike occurs. Right? The, the spikes seem to skip many cycles. And then the neuron spikes, and then there are hundreds or, or tens of, uh, of cycles, and the, the next spike happens. So for the neuron, it seems to be hard intuitively to keep track of the phase of the cycle if there are so few spikes, right? Yeah. This is the intuition between, um, this is the intuition leading to the fact that linear response functions 
should be dependent on the firing rate of the neuron. Because if, if the cutoff um, is related to the precision of the spikes, then if the spikes are very far apart, then that precision could be compromised. And you will be um, imprecise in when you fire the spike. This is just the intuition coming from this particular model calculation. Okay? However, this is not to say that it has to be so. It's just, an, it's just an intuition. So neurons are in fact here, this is the experiment that, that we've done, is that in this particular example, the neurons were firing at about 5 hertz, 5 to 10 hertz, but they in fact could transmit stimuli that are about 10, 20 times higher than the firing rate. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah? But it's kind of a ballpark estimate of what frequencies you could reasonably assume the neuron to follow. Yeah? But it's not to say that, okay, firing rate, and that's the cutoff of, of your frequency response. That's not the case. Okay? And here is another interesting observation, that correlated background noise can promote higher frequencies. And when we look at this linear response function, we observe that when we computed the linear response function, we, assumed a we, we did not necessarily assume a specific stimulus shape. However, we, we have to make assumptions about what the background is. We can only control the stimulus, but we cannot control the outside world of the neuron. But in this particular um, numerical experiment in leak integrating fire, the authors could control the background. And in this particular linear response function, the background noise that was present on top of the stimulus, that noise was white, which means the frequency spectrum was, was going up to uh, hundreds and thousands of, her of um, um, hertz. But in this particular experiment, the, the noise was correlated. It had a longer time constant. So we don't, don't change anything about our stimulus but we, we change the background on which the stimulus is presented. And it seems that in order to obtain higher response for higher frequencies, going from this curve to this curve, it is beneficial to use correlated noise, right? Mm -hmm. So these are two messages that are really important to, to keep in mind. The more neurons spike, the higher frequencies they can encode. Yeah? Potentially they can encode if, if the neurons spike more, they could encode uh, all frequencies a little bit better because the response function is raised, but they could also encode more higher frequencies because the range of the frequencies they cover is now increased. And the second message is to say that the background on which you present your stimulus matters. If it is correlated, you could encode higher frequencies. Okay? Now, um, kind of alluding to the sort of uh, calculation that you can do in the tutorial is the following. We would consider a threshold model in which the spikes are generated through a, spike, a, a positive crossing of a specific threshold, and this will be the spike times. When these events occur, this would denote the occurrence of a spike. And in this particular model, we will calculate, using pen and paper, the linear response functions. And what we will discover is that the linear response functions depend on the background noise that we put in, and they also depend on the firing rate. But that's kind of uh, to see in your own hands that these parameters that you put in the model will shape the linear response that you obtain. Okay? This is the calculations that we can do in a specific model. Obviously, these calculations can be done for other models, but the mathematics is a little bit harder. So I took the model, which I think can be done in the afternoon, but for leaky integrating fire, would need focal planck equations or for conducting space models. It's just, just technically more difficult, but it it's can be done and has been done by, by other uh, people. And, and important to note that the model we take here is strictly not an integrated fire model, but um, the work by Lawrence, ba uh, Lawrence Badel has shown that in some important parameter limits, these models are identical. So even so, this is not a leaky integrated fire model, it could be understood as a leaky integrated fire model in specific biological re relevant parameter range. Yeah? This is something to keep in mind because I often get questions related to how similar is leaky integrated fire to this particular threshold model calculation. Okay, now we come to the sort of um, question 
that um, could put in perspective of what I have been saying. And the question is, is there a universal response function for a given neuronal type? Let's say you are interested in pyramidal neurons and you're asking yourself, what is the linear response function? Can somebody give an answer to that question? Is there one or is there no one? Not one. Anybody? Raise your hand if you think there is one. Oh, that's, that's the right answer. <laughs> that's the right answer. There is no universal function. It depends on background noise, it depends on the firing rate, your thresholds, and everything else. Okay? So, a lot of people say, there is a response function we have measured. Yes, but if you change the parameters, you can measure again. That's basically the, the message. Okay, um, now I would come to the synchrony and pairwise correlations, and how are we doing on time? Is that? <coughs> 130. Oh, okay, so we have plenty of time. Um, yeah. yeah? Okay, now we come to the synchrony and pairwise correlations, and here I hope to convey to you how this linear response function is useful in understanding spike correlations between neurons. Okay, so we, here we consider the following situation. We take two neurons out of a network. The first neuron is in red and the second neuron is in blue. And we consider these neurons in the following way. We analyze the presynaptic partners. And we will discover that some of these presynaptic partners are the same. And those common presynaptic partners are denoted by the black circles here. It means that this presynaptic partner neuron is projecting to both neurons. And the activity of these neurons, these partner neurons, will be denoted by NC, whereby C denotes the, the notion that they are common to, to, both, part, uh, to both neurons. Okay? And if we look at the current that these neurons receive, we will discover that part of it, the, the somatic current that these neurons get, that part of this current is coming from this common part. And part of this current comes from the rest. And um, what we denoted by square root of R, R is the ratio of the common versus individual um, inputs. So if R is one, it means that one minus R is zero, so there is only common input. If R is zero, it means that there is only different types of input. So R between zero and one denotes the percentage of common input. And N denotes the activity of those common partners. Okay? This also accounts for partners that are themselves correlated. Yeah, so we, we take the, the correlated partners in a sense and we uh, break it down into things that are common and things that are uncommon. So um, mathematically, what you can do for, for Gaussian processes, but you can also do it for, for other things, the math is a bit more complicated. Uh, if you have two correlated inputs, you can break it down into three parts, mm -hmm. of which one is the same and two are different. And now you mix them. Yeah? And that's something that we have done here. So what we are doing here is now we are decomposing the input to two neurons of interest into parts that are common and parts that are different. Parts that are common are denoted by NC, noise that is common, and N1 and N2 are those individual no noise components that are different, statistically independent between the neurons. And what we are now interested in is the firing rate of the neuron 2 relative to neuron 1. So we trigger the spikes or the firing rate of neuron 2 to the events that happened in neuron one. This is the spike correlation function that we are interested in. This would be zero, or, or the relative time would be zero, and we are interested to see if there is a surplus of synchronous spikes in the neuron two whenever neuron one fired. So we were just curious about how much of these, how many of these spikes occur coincidentally in a sense. Yeah? That's the function that we would compute. And mathematically, what we obtain is the following. We compute the correlation between the response of neuron one <coughs> multiplied with the response of neuron two. 
And here it is important to pay attention to the fact that here we have a plus tau. So if tau is equal to zero, we are interested in exactly coincident spikes. If tau is, let's say, five milliseconds, it means that we are interested in this time delay between the spikes. And now we decompose the response of the neurons into the, uh, using the assumption that the input, which is the, the, the current, um, is convolved with our linear response and gives the fine rate. So basically, we, we convolve this particular current with the uh, linear response filter of our neurons. We've done that <coughs> for the first neuron. We've done that for the second neuron. And here we used also the assumption that this part and this part are uncorrelated, so we can already drop them out. So when we compute the correlation, they, they, they won't matter. So what we are left with is the linear response function multiplied with the correlated input for one neuron. And here we have the square root of r, which comes from here, times the filter times the, um, the common noise of the other neuron. Is this calculation clear to everybody, or should I discuss more? Here, sorry. This tau. should be tau. Tau. Yes, this should be tau. Very good question. Um, yeah, la Latte ch changes this thing sometimes. Okay. Um, so what we do next is the following. We, we transfer this function into the Fourier domain. It means Fourier, correla uh, Fourier transform of a correlation is a multiplication. So we do that on the left-hand side, and we recognize that this is response of neuron 1 in the Fourier domain times the response of neuron 2 complex conjugate <coughs> of it. And this is the, the definition of our cross-correlation function. Now, what happens on the left side? Uh, it, because we know that the linear response times the, uh, times the common noise, that's our linear approximation for our firing rate. So now we need to, uh, to bring that into the Fourier domain. What we obtain is um, this will be linear response times NC times linear response complex conjugate times uh, NC um, complex conjugate. So now we have from this part and from this part um, the linear response times its conjugate. So that will give us the absolute value of the linear response to the power of 2. And here we have the power spectrum of our input. And that comes from this part and from this part. From this part we have the uh, non-complex conjugate and from this part we have the uh, respective complex conjugate. And that ends up in this term. And here is r, because here we had square root of r and here square root of r. This is the ratio of the common uh, terms. Yeah. Is this calculation clear to everybody? So basically, the spike correlation function, or spike cross-correlation function between two neurons is nothing but the linear response function multiplied by the power spectrum of the common noise. OK? I mean, you're assuming that they have the same uh response function. Exactly. And if they didn't, they just have to do a subtraction or something. No, they, they, they will be multiplied by each other. Ah, okay, yes, okay. One response function times the complex conjugate of the other one. Yes. Okay. So, what can we do with this? Now, if we knew that the linear response function was such as described in this paper, that the more neurons fire, the higher frequencies they can represent. So if we assume that if we have firing rate number one, the linear response breaks off here, but if we have firing rate number two, the linear response would break off at a higher, at a higher frequency. Yeah? What can we infer from this knowledge alone about pairwise correlation functions? Yes, we subtracted the average. Ah, we, we already did that. We already did that. Yeah, that. That's a good question because remember the linear response was defined 
relative to the background, to the, to re to the steady state background. And we subtracted that. And the background would also be uncorrelated to itself, so that would be just a constant added to, to everything. Okay? So if you remember that the firing rate influences our response function, it is plausible to assume that it will also influence our pairwise correlations. Is this intuition clear? Regardless of how specifically it does that, whether the higher firing rates um, get more higher frequencies represented or higher firing rates could also lead to some sort of resonance, the moment firing rates if affect our linear response, we know that, firing, uh, that pairwise correlations would also be susceptible to changes in firing rate. So this uh, has been obviously observed in a number of publications. These are three examples. This is our own work. And this is work by uh, Greenberg and al. And this is uh, De La Rocha et al. So here, what many authors have recorded is that firing rates increase um, correlations, pairwise correlations increase with firing rate. And they do that because linear response functions increase with firing rate. And we, we know from the definition that pairwise correlation between neurons is directly proportional to our linear response. So if the linear response is proportional to firing rate, then yes, our pairwise correlations will do so, will do so too. And that's what, what we observe. In this particular threshold spiking neuron, if the firing rates go up, so does the correlation. And that's due to the linear response. And, and these are experimental findings that could be explained using the same notion of linear response being dependent on firing rate. OK, um, let me just get a, I, mean, I think better in terms of factors. So if, uh, basically, what you're saying here is that the correlation, if this is a, some kind of inner product, mm -hmm. then it's yeah. because the it's because the inner product depends in the model of the vectors, not on the other mm -hmm. And that's why. Uh, Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So pairwise correlation yes. coefficients are an integral over the whole function. But if the function depends on fine rate, so we'll do the, in, uh, so we'll do the integrals. So we can break down and, and look at the mechanics that, that lead to fine rate dependence of correlations. So this is an example that I, I find particularly beautiful because um, linear response takes us from synchrony to the intrinsic properties of the neurons to respond to periodic stimuli. Th these two are related. Even so, when these experiments were done, or when, when these experiments were done in live mice that are behaving, there is no notion of, of sinusoids, right? There is just uh, recording of two neurons. But the fact that they are correlated has to do with the fact that intrinsically in them, the linear response function has some, some property that lead to, to the, this effect. And that's something that I find amazing, that not just models for spiking correlations and models for linear response, but they actually interact with each other. So just a quick question. If you have the sort of an intuitive way of looking at the correlation with firing rate, is it because if you have like fixed time window delta t, and we have five higher firing rate, you basically have more spikes, so there is more chance for them to overlap and be um, So the, the chance overlap has been taken out. Uh -huh. So you remember what we've done here, we subtracted the baseline. Okay. So the, the notion that there are more synchronous spikes because there are more spikes overall, that has been taken care of. Okay. But it's the fact that the more neurons, um, how should I say it? The fact that this little correlation in, in the input will lead to more synchronous spikes that would be there if, if they were just there by chance. Yeah? Or there is also another intuition to understand this particular effect that uh, fine rates influence spiking correlation. So if you think about the following, so the math clearly tells us that linear responses matter and that linear responses help us um, understand the mechanics of why why this happens right because of this multiplication but if you think about 
it intuitively, what you get is the following. So if, if this is neuron one, and this is neuron two, and there are very few spikes here. And let's say they had a common stimulus that was like this. This is NC, this is our common stimulus. And these neurons here are trying to understand or are trying to represent the common, the common part. But the structure of the stimulus is such that the spikes are just too rare to capture any structure of the stimulus. So the more spikes we put into the neuron, the more chance we have to resolve the common structure. And, and that's why pairwise correlations, or that's why fine rates should increase the correlation, because the correlation happens due to the common noise that you now resolve better with more spikes. But mathematically, it back comes back to the linear response being rate dependent. Okay. Now, the quiz. Can we extract linear response functions from pairwise correlations? So imagine somebody gave you a pairwise correlation function from neuron one to neuron two. And that function looks somehow complicated, has a peak maybe. Can you extract the linear response from it? And I give you the stimulus too. I give you the common stimulus for free. Yeah. Now lo let's look at this again. We would compute the Fourier transform of the spike correlation function. We would compute the Fourier transform of our stimulus and we would divide them by one another. However, what we notice here, here we have only the absolute magnitude of the linear responses. So we will not have information about the phases. If we don't care about the phases, then we are fine. But if we care about the structure, the, like the full structure of the linear response, then this particular approach won't have enough information. But most of it, if we care about the amplitude changes as a function of frequency, then yes, that will be answering our question. And coming back to your question, what happens if the neurons have different response functions, then we will be able to extract the product of the two. Okay, now we come to the uh, phenomenon of phase transitions between irregular and periodic activity. And the question of how linear response functions can help us understand this transition. To this end, we consider the following. We have an irregularly active neuron uh, network, and we are interested in the transition between irregular and regular firing rate. We are interested specifically in two questions. If it is periodically active, what frequency has it? And the question of when will it start to be oscillatory? Yeah. When does it happen? And when it happens, what actually is the frequency? And here, um, to understand that mathematically, and there are very few equations uh, here, we don't need to be scared. What we will do is we will intuitively, uh, we will intuitively walk towards the into, uh, in, into the equations, but um, the equation itself are not as informative. So it, it's better to understand the steps that lead to that yeah? and not try to memorize the equations at this point. So what we imagine is the following. We start with the irregularly active network and we imagine just by chance there is a perturbation occurring in all the neurons, just randomly. No control about it, just appears randomly. And the perturbation is a sinusoid. So imagine for, for a brief second, all neurons in our network experience a, um, a sinusoidal perturbation of the current, randomly occurring, not experimentally imposed. And um, now, for now, we consider a network where each neuron uh, has the same property. They may not be uh, identically connected to each other. This is not an all-to-all -all network, but each neuron, there's only one type of neurons in the network. That's why it's 
it may be easier to, to imagine that all neurons belong to one population and that population is now experiencing a random fluctuation that's common across all the neurons in the population. So what happens? What happens is the following. We know also from Juliana's presentation that the firing rate of the neurons is determined by the input current and that input current is passed through a transformation, input-output transformation or IF transformation. Now, when we perturb the input current, we will perturb naturally the firing rates of the neurons. Yeah? But what happens next, because it is a recurrently connected neuron, is something fascinating. When we perturb an in input current, we will perturb the firing rates of the neurons. However, this is a self-consistent equation, which means the left side is appearing on the right side. So the moment we perturb the input current, we perturb the firing rate. When we perturb the firing rate, we will perturb input current, firing rate, input current, so on. So that's kind of an infinite loop. So one perturbation will rever reverberate through the network. It could be amplified through these this, um, this steps, or it can be damped and down. And the moment it gets amplified, that's the moment where, um, where, where global order could emerge. And that's the transition we are looking for. So mathematically what we are looking for is the following. This is the sort of self-consistency equation and here I'm leaving out the details of the model because they really don't matter for this calculation or for this approach, uh, for setting up this approach. We have a self-consistent equation where the firing rates appear on both sides. They are equal to the IF transformation. J is the connectivity matrix times R plus I. Regardless of what F is, what we will be encountering is the following. When we have a small oscillatory perturbation in the somatic current, we will need a linear response function to give us the oscillatory perturbation in the firing rate. That calculation will depend, of course, on the structure of your spiking network, on the connectivity and everything else, on the type of neural dynamics you implement. But basically, what you are really interested in is how this perturbation in the somatic current is transferred, and what's the linear response function, in the firing rate. So from one delta, you want to have that, that proportionality factor. How changes in current lead to changes in firing rate. This is one part of the transformation that you're interested in. The second part is going from the firing rate transformation into somatic current perturbations. So if you know that there was a firing rate perturbation how much does that perturb your current? And that's the, the other uh, prefactor that you're interested in here. So you started at this step, you had that perturbation. That was the result of this calculation. And now you're looking for an additional linear response, which is this, uh, this factor, often it's called S. Other people may be using F. But anyway, so you have, in a, in a self-consistent uh, approach, in a recurrent network, you have two linear transformations, one from current to firing rate and one from firing rate to current. And if you multiply them, so if this factor ends up bigger than the initial factor, then that's the point where the perturbation will grow in amplitude, that it will, will, it will catch momentum and essentially it will grow in amplitude and will overtake the dynamics. Yeah? So the breaking point for the stability of a perturbation is when the first part is smaller than the part after the, the loop through the network. So if this result is bigger than the initial um, size of the perturbation, then the perturbation is unstable. And mathematically what happens is that after we multiply the response functions here and here, this is the first response function, this is the second one, times the initial delta, if this is bigger than the initial delta, then that's the breaking point and we will have an oscillatory um, activity because any randomly occurring perturbation will grow in amplitude. However, there is also a, a little asterisk. This is, a li this is first order calculations. Mathematically, you should also look at Lyapunov um, coefficients to make sure that the oscillation that emerges, so these calculations will tell us there will be an oscillation emerging However, it doesn't tell us whether it will be stable or not. However, m in many cases, it will be stable. So the intuition here is that first you need to compute if there is 
an, a, a perturbation that is becoming unstable. So the, the original state is no longer stable because this little perturbation will grow in amplitude, but the resulting oscillatory dynamics needs to be stable too. And that's the, the other caveat, basically. But the first order calculation is the following. You just need to sum up or to multiply your linear response functions from current to fine rate, fine rate to current, and check if this is equal to one or is bigger than one. And if it is so, if it is fulfilled for some omega, that will be the frequency of your oscillatory cycle. And if you are looking at, um, at the multidimensional network, then you have to compute this linear response functions for each sort of excitatory to inhibitory, inhibitory to inhibitory, and all, all of these um, all of these population to population metrics and if you have subpopulations and you have an, an added complexity but regardless of the details what you are really looking for is whether the little oscillatory perturbation that you started with is growing momentum or whether it's damping down and the way you check that is for this multiplicative factor for a single population to be equal to one that's the breaking point or the determinant of this perturbation matrix being equal to one, if you have a multidimensional network. This is um, work that we have done together with uh, Claudia Klopat, who will be also a lecturer in this course. Uh, and here we, we investigated how gap junction strength helps transitioning from irregular to oscillatory phases. And this is work that has been done before that, how network activity um, looks like on two sides of the uh, bifurcation that's also related to, to gap junctions. However, this is obviously, the math is not related, is independent of the details of the model. It tells us what features we need to be looking for in order to understand when any given network of interest is transitioning to oscillations. So if you think about it, linear response functions are linear, which means they are describing the properties of the networks with respect to small perturbations, but small perturbations can, can add up and can lead to global dynamics. And the breaking point when that happens is, is due to the structure of these functions. Okay, then I will briefly touch on the <coughs> linear and nonlinear models and mention how linear response functions can be useful in this context too. So you, re you remember we started off with the notion that linear, that the fine rate R can be used, uh, can be described by the linear response kernel times the stimulus. Yeah? We had R of T equal to linear response times the stimulus, or filtered by the stimulus, uh, multiplied by the stimulus. And what we actually have, if we have the stimulus being stronger in amplitude is that we have to have higher order contributions. So the, the theory by v Norbert Wiener informs us that we have to sum up across all functions that are going from the first order to nth order. And only then we will be describing our nonlinear system of interest completely. So the linear order is not enough. And we have to um, sum up across all other more complex filters. However, this is in generally a very tedious task because you have to compute nth order filters. You have to have enough experiments to be able to do so precisely. So in order to, to um, overcome this complexity and kind of not be interested in higher order kernels, instead what we can do is we can approximate our fine rate by a stationary nonlinearity. So we take the first order and we drop all the rest, but what we add to our calculation is a stationary nonlinearity. We just raise our linear response to uh, and, uh, and apply to it a nonlinear function. So all of these nonlinear kernels that we should be taking into account are replaced by one stationary nonlinearity. Mm -hmm. This is kind of the approach of linear and nonlinear models. And um, the idea here is, is depicted by a paper by Osto um, Surgeon Ostojic, and there, um, there is work by um, Jonathan Pillow and colleagues on this too. But basically, uh, basically what this work sh shows is that it is possible to describe the fine rate 
of neurons that are clearly nonlinear using a combination of linear and nonlinear transformations. And we have talked about the usefulness and the way to obtain linear response filters. Now the question is just how can we find this nonlinearity? What, what is the approach to find this nonlinearity? And it turns out that it is possible to use the IF transformation, so the stationary current transformation, the, the, the change, the function describing the change current to fine grade, we can use this particular IF function uh, in place of this um, nonlinearity n. And that's a beautiful work uh, detailed in this paper. And um, what these graphs show is the correlation between the um, actual spiking activity and the various approximations. So what you see here is that the correlations between uh, the signal and the fine rate or the uh, um, linear nonlinear model, uh, linear nonlinear approximation, which is this part, this can be pretty high. You, you notice that the, um, the, the um, green line is on the order between 0 0.8 and 1. So that's a very good approximation. And this happens um, in different parameter regimes. So you see here on, on this axis, IS, which is the um, input current, this is the stimulus time constant, this is the noise time constant, the fine rates, and so on. And all of these graphs show you that the yellow, uh, the, the green line, linear nonlinear approximation, gives you a very good estimate of the actual fine rate. Even so, it's, it's actually a very strong approximation. It says that the nonlinearity is independent of the um, structure of the stimulus or uh, structure of the um, linear response. So you kind of decouple the two, you compute one first and then you apply the other. And, and this work is something um, that um, I find particularly useful because it allows you to predict systematically what the nonlinearity will be for a given spiking neural network, for a given spiking model, to be precise. So now comes the last quiz. Could you name three plausible nonlinearity functions? So those n functions that we have been using in the last slides. What could be a plausible nonlinearity from the talks of Ken Miller, Juliana, and others? Is there any candidate function that you could think of? Sigmoids. Sigmoids, wonderful. Yes. Anything else? A step thing, maybe. The what? A step function. Could also be, yes. Gaussians? Mm, less so because the Gaussians decay um, after some time. What about power laws? Exponentials. Exponentials have been used a lot. So basically anything that will give you a rising part for higher input currents. But they don't have to necessarily be monotonic, right? So Gaussians no. would be a good model for orientation selective neurons. It's an FI curve, right? That's right. Yes, it, it also matters in what, frequ um, in what input range you're trying to understand the activity. If you really care about this tapering off for higher uh, fine rate, then, then yes, you should use, use something like a Gaussian. If you care about this rising slope, because you think that that's something that represents your activity better, then you should take something like exponentials, maybe even um, step functions, or, or power law nonlinearities or just a linear function, threshold linear would also do. And the reason we need a nonlinearity, maybe that, that's something that, that hasn't been as clear, is that um, stimuli can be negative, but fine rates usually can't be negative. So when we convolve a stimulus with a linear response filter, there is potentially the opportunity to become negative in the fine rate. As long as we are uh, positioned relative to a steady state and we have this slow or small fluctuation around the steady state, then we won't hit zero. But if we really care about larger amplitude stimuli, and we, if the stimuli are small, then we don't need this nonlinearity, basically. It will all be a factor that we can take into account in the linear response function. But if we care about larger stimuli, stimulus amplitudes, we need to think about how to include those higher order contributions. And, and there we need to prevent the negativity. And one way to prevent negativity is to uh, take our linear response contribution and raise it or put it as an argument in an exponential 
threshold linear, what, what have you, basically. And that, that's the approach that, that these uh, models do. OK, and, and to conclude, what, why would that be a useful approach? And how can we think about neural networks when we use linear and nonlinear models? Or what can it, linearity, um, or what, our, what can our understanding that is based on linearity contribute to a larger understanding of neural network function? Because I think um, it is fairly clear that neural networks are not linear. So if we were to limit ourselves to linear response functions, we would um, apply them consecutively from LGN to cortex and, and from cortex to other cortical regions. And we will just um, add up to make a big linear transformation. We can't represent any complex function. So there is actually mathematical work showing that in order to make complex um, functions, you need a nonlinearity, which means that you can add a nonlinearity at, at each individual layer, or you can combine nonlinearity between the layers, but without a nonlinear function, you can't represent, um, you can represent XORs, you can't represent addition, you can't do much, basically. It's basically because, like, a combination of two linear functions, the linear should exactly. just get one transformation. Yeah. Linear, right? yeah, exactly. So linear functions will remain linear in their combinations. But we no, all know that nonlinearity is not only in themselves, but they are important. But they, they make us able to construct complex functions such as um, classification, such as um, multiplication, addition, uh, selection, any, any um, higher order function that you can think of requires some nonlinearity at some stage or potentially at all stages. So we need to understand not only linear transformations, even so linear transformations are entering here too, so we need to understand them, but they're not enough. And importantly, here, uh, if you re recall, the linear response function depends on the noise, depends on the thresholds. It, there is no one linear response function. So when we think about these cascades, we need to recall that um, when we put the stimulus statistics in, and we assume that there is some, some noise um, happening that we can't control. The moment we change the stimulus statistics, something changes about the noise, the response, the fine rates, everything else, so that we need a different response kernel each time. So it's, it's, it's really hard to establish a, a nonlinear mapping between a stimulus and the response because the functions inside this, this feedforward uh, circuit really change uh, in our hands. As, as we change the, the statistics, they need to change too. So we, we can't um, easily concatenate them one after the other. Hmm? So, even so that's the very appealing notion that understanding nonlinear transformation here, uh, here and here individually will, will lead us to, to a global understanding. That's actually very, very hard to defend because each function depends on so many parameters and they probably are interconnected so that we can't use this simplistic approach. Okay, what are the take home messages from, our, uh, from this lecture? Linear response function is a powerful tool to study the dynamical properties of networks. It is related to pairwise correlations and receptive fields, gains, um, susceptibility measures and so on. And linear nonlinear models can be a good approximation for fine rate activity. However, we need to be very cautious about applying them in feed-forward um, manners. And importantly, there is no universal linear response function for a neuronal type. There's so many parameters enter this calculation that the moment you measure it and you change something about it, you need to recalculate or remeasure the linear response function. It's a, it's a useful way to characterize, but we need to be careful about what shapes this function. So thank you very much for your attention, and if there are no further questions, we can move on to the discussion.